today we're going to talk about a specific concept that appears in Fabris and in the line of Fabris. Uh, everyone's familiar with Silvatore Fabris, right? Yes. Cool. Is there someone who isn't? Let's start from that. Someone who isn't. Someone who is not familiar with Salvatore Fabris. Familiar is have done one workshop. Don't mean Dali. Yeah. It's fine. Like okay. So uh, it's enough to know that this is a fencing master that uh, released his treatise in the early 17th century, and he founded a his own lineage of fencing that then survived in a couple of centuries. Um, one of the specific things about his style is that he has a specific way of approaching fencing. And this is what we're going to be exploring today. Um, this style of fencing, he calls it Caminare con Resoluzione, or Walking with Resolution. And if you've read the Tom Leone translation, this might be more famous as Proceeding with Resolution. The very foundation of this uh, thing is uh, two important concepts. The first concept is the idea of pressure, the idea of pressuring your opponent tactically, the idea of uh, making sure that they're uncomfortable, and the second idea is the most uh, is more technical one, and that, that is using natural steps. So, a lot of the fencing that was happening back then, and it happens even today, and if you ever go and take a class in like Olympic Epe, all the way to taking like lessons in more usual rapier, usually they're going to teach you that we're going to have a guard when one foot is in front, one foot is in the back, we'll be standing like this, and we will be more or less moving back and forth like this. You know, pretending that we're a little bit, a little bit of crabs. Of course, there is a variation there. Of course, we all have passing steps. We have things like that. But the foundation of this, let's call it newer style of fencing, is that you're walking like a crab and you're attacking with your foot on the ground doing those lunges. This is what is called firm-footed fencing. And uh, it's called after the firm-footed attack, which can be a lunge with a step. Could be something that we just do. The other way to approach fencing is closer to what uh, our friends from Spain do, and that is just walking, which has its own advantages. It has its own good things. Um, but we'll get back to that. First, we're going to start with the concept of pressure. So the basic idea of this is that when I'm fencing someone, as I'm getting closer, I will get the point that they are triggered. They will have to attack me or they're gonna get stabbed. Like if I may borrow you. Everyone has experienced this, like if you find someone, if you try getting closer to them, at, at some point you're gonna get close enough, they're gonna go and stab you, right? And we can exploit this. We can use this to, to basically learn where their trigger point is. And then knowing that, knowing where their trigger point is, we can then trigger them, take their own reaction, and stab them. Or in another way, we can force them to give us a tempo. We're going to start with a little bit of an exercise for that, and then we're going to build up from there. So the first thing is that everybody's going to need to find a friend. So split up two and two. One more note, or a lot of notes. I have my notes here. There's a lot of stuff that I have explained there because we're at a limited time pressure here. I'm a little bit nervous and I'm going to miss some points. You can scan the QR code to get access. I'm sorry for using QR codes. Uh, it's the mark of Satan. Uh, you can scan it to get access to the notes. I am sure that they will make a lot more sense. You are also going to be able to find all of the different drills that we're going to do here. So, before we delve into a little bit more theory, we're going to start with our first exercise. We are going to have one fencer who has a weapon, and they're standing in one spot. Uh, Nicole, can I borrow you? So, we're going to need a lot of space for this. That fencer that is there is going to have available to them only one action, and that is just a lunge. On the other hand, I'm not going to need a weapon if I'm the other fencer. My goal, okay, maybe I should explain it. My goal would be simply to engard. My goal would be to get close 
until, I don't know, I'm just going to get close. Whenever she feels the chicken hit me and it's time for her to hit me, she's going to do a lunge. Right, she's going to attack me. And I'm going in. Boom. My goal is to bait her to make an attack. So the goal of this exercise is that I move in, I move in, I move in. Boom. If she misses, that's a point for me. If she succeeds, that's a point for her. We continue doing this until five points, one side gets five points, then we switch around. And once we have done this, we're going to come back here and we're going to talk about it. Couple of extra things to do for this one. As the person who is baiting the attacks, try to use normal walking steps. Try to see how the size of your step changes things and try to see, try to go, you know, boom. Try to be dynamic, try to bait them, try to turn it into a game. Does it make sense? Any questions? Cool, let's go and do this. Five points, change around, five points, and then we go back and talk about it. So that was the first exercise. Out of this workshop, you will get a few more exercises. Like when we're done with this, you will not be like a master of proceeding with resolution, but you will have to have the tools to take this at home and practice it. Those tools also teach you other important concepts that are always fundamental, such as distance. Um, here's another piece of the puzzle. When you're doing normal fencing, let's just call it normal fencing. When we're doing normal fencing, what we're trying to usually do is that we're trying to push the opponent to do some kind of an action very often when we are doing an action. An example could be, if I may borrow you, an example could be, and this happens very often when we fence, I move in to gain her blade. This is an action that I'm giving her. I am hoping that she's going to disengage so that while she's disengaging, I can use the opportunity to attack her. Alternatively, I might be giving her an action where I, I try to do something fake, I'm hoping that she's going to take that to do something else so I can give the real attack. In other words, I'm trying, to put, I'm trying to give an action to the opponent, so hopefully they're going to take it and I can exploit that. In the words of Fabris himself, there are others who, when, when within distance, seek to gain no advantage, but seeing that their adversary does not move, try to make them move by giving them an opening or offering a time or by an appeal or a feint in order to take the time of his moving. And that's actually kind of inefficient and stupid because I need to... I really, really, really hope that when I'm giving this action, she will take the bait. She will come at me. What happens if she doesn't take the bait? Boom, we're back at square one. What happens if she's faster than me? It might be that she's very, very, very good at disengages. So I am thinking everything is fine. I'm giving her a tempo and then she's stopping me. We can do something else. We can apply pressure, which is what we did with the first drill. Whenever I'm going here, I'm giving you pressure. Speaking of which, how did the first drill go? At the, like just popcorn style, did you manage to make it work as a defender? Did you get better at assessing the distance where the opponent is going to attack? Yeah. Ooh, yes. Feeling that it's a winning strategy for the one with the rapier to wait very long. Yeah. <laughs> yes. To get really close. So there is something there about applying too much pressure. If you push the opponent too much, they're going to be smart enough and they're going to exploit this. So we need to pressure, 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 and release. This is what this exercise teaches us. The second thing that we learn here is from distance. We need to be just very, very, very precise. Um if you just give me a moment to find my notes. The third thing that we learn from this is that everybody has a trigger point and you can, you can assess that. So, general rules, general things that we want to learn from here. First of, one, first of all, we want to be using this type of thing. We want to be walking towards the opponent. 
but we want to make sure that we are in control. We are the ones that are setting the terms. We do this by creating a good initial geometry. Second thing that we want to do when we're doing this is that we want to be steady. We don't want to rush. We don't want to be jagged. We want to have a steady and relenting pressure because then we can react. And uh, the third thing that's very, very important is that we want to occupy the line of their sword as we're going in. And we're going to do another small exercise to get this part to work. So we're going to have the same setup again. One person is going to be standing in a guard. This time they're not going to attack. This time they're going to be a nice little compliable puppet. And it's going to work like this. I am going to be approaching again with small walking steps. Try to keep them small. If you want to do this by the book, you might even lean forward. If this is too heavy on your back, it's fine, don't overdo it. Second thing, I want you to keep your arm steady. So, we don't want to gain their blades, boom, boom, right? That's bullshit. We start from far away, our hand is already in place, and we start walking towards them. Third part of the exercise, once we're about to enter, we're going to place our foot right in front of their tip. Our second step is going to be right in front of the first step. And our third step is going to be wounding them. Then they're going to move somewhere else. Just move somewhere else. Take a different guard. We do the same thing. I start from very far away. I place my blade in a way that when I arrive there, it's going to be safe and I start walking. Pum, pum, pum. My next step is going to be in front of her tip. In front of her tip, walking in. Then they're going to move and they're going to take a third guard. And then we do it all again. Is it making sense as an exercise? Cool. Yes? Can you keep your sword arm deliberately withdrawn? Yes. So, you might choose to keep your arm slightly withdrawn. You might want to keep it slightly bended. I don't want to see this. This is not exactly great. I want to see a slight bend in the elbow. The thing that is most important for this exercise, however, is blade up. The last steps need to be in line with the weapon of the opponent. Boom, boom, boom. Second most important thing is we want to be using small walking steps. Go try it out. This is a bit of a static exercise. And the goal of this exercise is to teach you to gain the opponent's blade, not with your hand, but with your feet and with your hips. Which is what happens when you put your feet in line of their sword. One thing that is important to make this work is to have your blade prepared in advance so that when you put that foot there, it gains the opponent's blade on its own. If you look at the book, um, this is more or less what's described in his first rule. So he gives you like several different rules. Each of them is building one upon the other. But the rule itself I find is a little bit static. And when, you, when you're engaging someone in a sparring, they'll be holding all kinds of different guards. So this is why as the teacher in this exercise, I will be taking different guards. I would sometimes put my sword all the way out here. I would put it here for the person that is gaining the blade, the game does not change. I still need to take the steps inside of that line. Um, of course, the thing is that nobody's gonna stay there stationary. Nobody's gonna wait for you to gain their blade. Nobody's going to wait for you to go and stab them. Most of the time, they will be trying to do something else. They'll be trying to disengage. They will be trying to break distance. They will be trying to stay away. They might be trying to attack you. So, not only should we use our feet to gain their blade, but we should always try to occupy their blade the way that Fabrice describes this is as, as if the two blades are tied together. So, we have one extra exercise for this. And this is going to look like this. We'll have a teacher and a student as well. 
I find that this works best with a dagger, but you can do it with a rapier as well. As a student, you will take a dagger in your main hand. If you don't have a dagger, if you have another weapon, just take it, hold it like this. And what we want to happen is the following. She will be the teacher, I will be the student. Blade up. So the teacher is going to be setting the distance. The teacher will be coming closer to me and I need to keep distance. The teacher might be moving away, I need to keep distance. The teacher might be moving sideways, I need to keep distance. This is step number one. Step number two is that at every single point, I want my dagger to be connected to her sword. So we're going to start here. She might take a step back and disengage and move around. I want to follow. I want to follow. I want to follow. Right? So the goal of this exercise is to always keep the blades together. If the blades end up being too far apart, during sparring, when you're trying to execute this approach, if this happens, you have fucked up, get the fuck out. If you do not have control over the blade. If you always have them together, keeping them sticky, they're gonna be more or less safe, allegedly. Go try it out. And you're controlling the tempo. If you see that your opponent is doing very good, you need to make things harder for them. If you see that they're struggling, you need to make it easier. Second thing, you need to be controlling the distance. If they're coming too close, you tell them, keep distance. If they're coming, if they're still too far away, you tell them, come closer. Let's do one more demonstration. Uh, you're gonna need a dagger. If I am the teacher, I want to keep things dynamic and I'm gonna start slow. So think about sticking, nice. Follow me, follow me, follow, 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 distance. Good, distance. Back, 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 back. Distance, 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 distance. You're too close, too close. Back, back, good, 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 good. This way, the more intense you make it, the more the person is going to have to follow your blade, they'll have to keep the blade sticky. Try to keep it in middle distance. Try it again and try to give a good feedback to your partner. Also maybe pick up a new partner for this one. So, how did it go? What do you think worked really well for you as a defender and what do you think didn't work so well? It, well, it, uh, when you change direction about what, which side of the blade you are in, yeah, when you follow it, it, that's very easy way to get yourself open. Yeah, I felt like when Nicole would like turn around, I was like, okay, I will do this motion, but it's not natural to me. So we kind of have to be a little bit efficient and to learn the motions, right? Uh, with this thing, I don't want to tell you what the motions are. I don't want to go with the play by the book. I don't want to tell you when he pressures you like this, you disengage. I want you to discover this, right? So that's why we're doing this dynamic exercise. It's going to translate so much better to sparring. Here's a question. Why are we doing this with a dagger and not with a proper rapier? To force us to have a strong all the time. Good. It's a little bit of a muscle memory, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Because if you look at the different rules, if you look in the different ways that this is approached again in the different books, usually you're going to be using the bottom half of your rapier where it's strong. This is what you want to be using to be keeping control of the opponent. For a very natural reason that if you have the weak, then you're going to be pushed away. We're going to take this and then we're going to build it up with the rapier and now we're going to add an attack to it. It's going to work like this. We're going to have a teacher and a student, as usual. And the teacher will be the one that's setting the distance, just like we had in this exercise. Nico? So, this time we're moving around, moving around, moving around, whatever. At some point, as a teacher, 
I'm just going to extend my hand a little bit. When I do that, this is the signal for the student to take a step in, as we did in the first exercise, uh, the second exercise, and keep on walking towards me until she hits me. Keep on walking, keep on walking, just hit me when you feel comfortable. Good. Then we go again. Boom, 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 boom. Moving around. Signal. Don't move your hand. You want to step in. Signal. Step in. Follow, follow, follow. Look where I am. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Good. I will now put on my mask to show you this at a little bit of a higher speed. All right, in guard, and we go. Back, follow, 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 signal. Come on, come on, come on, look where I am. Good. Again. Back, signal. Good. Once again, like the previous exercise, you as a teacher are setting the tempo and you're setting the distance. You need to remind your partner, keep your distance or come step in, keep on walking, right? Until you get hit. Second thing as a teacher, Keep attention to what they're doing with their hand. Are they gaining your blade like this? Tell them no. Are they using their steps? That's good. We're going to start with just this variation. We're going to make this more complicated after a couple of repetitions. Is it making sense? Cool, go try it out. So when you do this, no matter how much pressure you put on the opponent, no matter if you reach a point where you're running backwards, it gets a little bit too easy for the other person. The next step to this exercise is to start adding complications as a teacher. So once we have done this for a while, I will go and tell my, I will tell my student, I'm going to add a complication. If I feel like it, I'm going to disengage. That is your problem. The way that this is going to work is, Nicole, if I may borrow you. So for the same thing, we're now going to add a disengage. I'm going to need a little bit of space. So follow me. Notice that their blades are separate. Notice that my signal is not an attack. It's just pushing. Boom. You need to come in and stab me. I don't like this. Disengage. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Faster, faster, faster. Good. I am not just going to stand there and wait. Again, follow me, boom, back, 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 back. Keep distance, keep distance, good. Signal, come on, come on, come on, stop. You can stop me earlier. Boom, 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 signal, boom, boom, good. Once you have done this five or six times, your opponent is going to get used to it. So then you add the next level, which is a parry. And guard, pushing. Here's a signal. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm going to parry, disengage and follow through. Boom. Come on, come on, stop. Good. Back, signal, boom, boom. Sorry. Good, excellent. Once you see that your student is used to the disengage, you add a parry. Once you see that they're used to the parry and the disengage, you add a counter attack. Once you see that they're used to all three of those, you start adding interruptions. So instead of just going backwards, you start going forward, you stand in place so that they can also learn to go back and forth. So let's try this again. As a teacher, do five times with adding a disengage, five times with adding a parry, five times with adding a counter attack on top of that. Would you like to see the counter-attack step as well? All right. You want to 
do it on me? It's fine. So, she's following me. I give the signal. So, this time when I disengage, I'll go for a stab. That's a counter attack. Let's try to do it again. Follow me. Boom, 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 boom. And it's your goal to deal with the counter attack, right? So we're making it more difficult for them. We're making it dynamic. If we see that they're struggling, if, you see, if we see that you're hitting them too much as a teacher, tone it down a little bit, remind them what to do and try to do it nice and slow. After a while, you can move this to full sparring. Again, as a teacher, you're the one that's giving the signal in the sparring situation. And from there on, it's free for all. Try it again. So we add a disengage. After five repetitions, we add a parry. And then we add a counter attack. Right? Go for it. How did it feel? Great. That was fun. Okay. What do you think was difficult as a student? Stamina, yes. Well, with the parry part, uh, I didn't manage to use it. Okay. So, yeah. So the thing is that usually when we do trainings, when we do things by the plates, we have a very clear ways how to do the parries, right? How to do things. But the key to getting to the opponent without stopping and just wounding them, doing as you want them to do, is to, is to be dynamic. And when you're being dynamic, when things are happening in the heat of the moment, you kind of need to deal with what's happening there. And this is a different skill from what happens when you're just doing normal drills. This is why we need to do it in a more dynamic way. This is why everything that we do needs to be brought closer to the sparring situation. And uh, what we're doing with those drills, we're extracting the basic principles. We're going to come back to this in a moment of this uh, proceeding with resolution thing. Uh, I will add a little bit of theory for at the end of the workshop. If you need some water, go grab some water because the next exercise is purely sparring one. Right? So if you need a little bit of stamina, go get some water and be back in uh, five minutes. Nice. So, so far what we did is a um, couple of exercises that give you together pieces of one big puzzle. The first part of our exercise is being very aware where, when you're entering the danger zone. Because when you do, that will depend on what your opponent can do to you. The second thing that we did is we learned an exercise about how do we enter that danger zone in a very safe way while also at the same time staying very, very, very ready to react to things because our hand should not be moving. And when our hand is not moving, it's ready to do things. The other exercise that we did is about being unrelenting, following that opponent, keep, keeping like, like a hound, hounding them, keeping on going forward. If we do those things together, we ensure that uh, the opponent is going to be very scared and we're going to get there before they can do a lot. When we approach them like this, we are also creating a situation where whether they want it or not, they're forced to react. They have no other choice. They have to do something. So we don't have to play stupid games with like feints. We don't have to uh, do fake attacks. We don't have to think about things like that. We're turning the game into a game of, into a very stabby game of chicken where they're the chicken and you're the fox. Um, there's a couple of things here that are very, very uh, specific to Salvatore Fabris. One of those is uh, those little walking steps that they keep uh, telling you, like, try to walk normally. Because um, this is the thing that he says, is if you walk normally, a little bit faster than usual and a little bit with smaller steps, you are very, very nimble. You can change direction at will. You can move around, you can fall back. At the same time, it creates a smooth motion, which means that there is no single tempo for the opponent to take. 
in a normal situation when you're moving in into the danger zone with a normal fencing step this is one huge tempo this is one huge opportunity if we're moving like this th there is no such opportunity in order to make just one moment in order to make this work we need to think about always having one foot in the air always keeping one leg backwards and the final part is keeping our steps small because once you start making big steps you're back to making big tempi if everything is small you're almost moving there like a freight train yes and the last one was actually what i was trying to ask about so what does it look like when, when you're doing the caminada with always having one foot in the air so to me this means always keeping small steps so um, there's a couple of things you can do as an extra conditioning for this that go beyond just fencing drills. You can always do squats because squats are going to be good for you. You can always do deadlifts because they give you stronger core so you can lean in like the books. But you can go and take some of Tom's workshops and do his drills for the stretcher. You can take a couple of the stretcher classes or even better, ditch that stuff and go sign up for some Latino dancing classes because they all do those small, nice little steps that are going to condition you to, to, do, to do this in fencing as well. And that's going to turn you into a little freight train of that. So we have one more exercise. And then after that, uh, we're going to talk about tactical considerations about applying this in sparring on tournaments and so on. The last exercise is as follows. We're going to do sparring. We're going to do much. Every round is going to be until, let's say, five points. If you hit an opponent, that's a point for you. If they hit you at the same time or an after blow, that's a point for them. Just figure it out with them. It's supposed to be free. It's supposed to be kind of relaxed. Here's the funky component. At the start of the sparring, you just go and do a little bit of rock, paper, scissors. The loser in that match is going to be trying to fence in a lot more linear way, the piede fermo way, right? The, the, the winner in our rock, paper, scissors is going to try to use our approach. And there is one more part to this, which is where we have those pists, which kind of got a little bit destroyed. So we're going to have to recreate them. Each match is going to happen in one pist. We're both going to start at uh, the middle. God damn it. You're going to have to recreate one for you, for yourselves. Self-organizing. So, the, every pist, every ring is defined by three areas. We have a middle where we start with the back foot on the line. Nicole, can I borrow you? And then we go back and forth sparring here's the trick any point scored in this middle part does not count if there is to be a point it needs to happen in one of the ends back 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 and for this to count you need to have at least one foot in that area right mm -hmm. likewise i have the other part here so if she's pressuring me points only count in this area So this is going to be interesting because there's going to be something there about being pressured. There's going to be there something about pressuring. There are people that feel a lot more comfortable when they're back in their own corner. There are people that fucking freak out. And when you're approaching this, you need to be thinking about how can I pressure them relentlessly, but not to a point where they freak out and we double each other. All right. So... Pick up a pist, try to rearrange things so that they're about equal parts and try to do a couple of rounds of fencing. Do the rock, paper, scissors. The winner, boom, 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 boom. The loser, boom, 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 boom. After you have done this round, you're going to do it again, but with the rows changed. After you're done with that, just come here in the middle, sit down, and then we're going to do a few last minutes of talking because time is advancing. All right? Uh, make sure that your gear is well closed. If you have a neck protector, please put the neck protector on and like take it easy. Finally, 
talk to your partner about the intensity of the match. You don't want to go like all wild. Just see how much they, how fast they want to go, how hard they want to go. Uh, yes. It's suggested, but if you do not have it, please talk your partner, take it a little bit easier. So, I really like this last exercise because it's creating some very interesting constraints. Like, you don't have anywhere to escape on the side, so you're forced to stay on this line, and you're really forced to start thinking about uh, how you're being pressured and how the pressure is happening, because if you just go in too fast and too hard, the opponent is going to become suicidal. You're, go you're both going to go down. If you're too slow, uh, it's going to get weird. And you want to also create a situation where maybe you want to pressure the opponent and then you want to release. Fall back a little bit, pressure them, release again. So you want to play on their nerves. You want to be a little bit tactical with this thing. And uh, for this type of stuff, it's very nice to have those uh, constraints like narrow pists with three zones. How did it go? Yes? It was difficult uh, because you keep that around the middle as much as possible. And there are a lot of chances that we can end up in points. Yes. So uh, all this stuff is something that comes over time. Like it's very normal, like if you're doing it right now to be a little bit chaotic. It, it's a type of drill that you do again and again and again, just like the previous drills. So if something felt awkward or weird or didn't make sense, take it home, try it a couple of more times. Maybe it will make sense. Or if not, you will have invested so much time into it that you're going to believe that it makes sense. Um, there's two more things that I want to note and then we're done. So the first thing is how do we combine this with everything that's in the books? So Fabris gives us six rules for proceeding with resolution uh, for the single rapier, and I think four when you're using rapier and dagger. Most of those rules consist of a specific setup. And now each of those rules builds together one on top of the other, adding together all of the concepts that we did, to get, that we did today. The best way that you can take those rules and apply them in practice is to take the setup that they describe. So they might describe that you're approaching with the sword up here, or they might tell you that you're going to approach with your sword fully extended. Take that as a setup and then start doing the drills, starting with that setup. Because once you enter into measure, once, the, once you go into the danger zone, all of these things, things start getting chaotic, all of the things start getting dynamic, and that's when we want to start applying those things with the drills that we did. Um, the other thing is that when we're doing this in sparring, when we're doing this in tournament, it's very, very important that we observe the opponent. Like, you might notice when you're doing this that suddenly both of you are clashing. Both of you are just kept on hitting each other. This might mean that both of you are trying to proceed with resolution or both of you are just very dynamic. In which case, this is not going to work. You're going to need to change tactics. So when you see that this is happening, you notice that your opponent is the one that's trying to, to rush in. That's good for you. Let them come. Disengage, get out of the way, stop them because proceeding with resolution relies on the opponent not knowing that you're gonna do it or not being very good at countering. If they know it, you're back to regular everyday tempo hunting. Another thing that's very important is to not rush. So if you notice that you end up in like a flurry of cuts, if you notice that uh, you're always missing, if you notice that you're ending up a lot in a grapple, this means that you're probably moving a little bit too fast, you need to tone it down and you need to adjust the distance. You might also notice that your opponent is always getting away, they're go always uh, getting out of the way. Again, they might be on to you, they might be familiar, they might have guessed that you're trying to do this thing to them or you might not be following through. So you need to remember that you also need to be like a hound, you need to pursue them. Um, yes, I think that's most of it. Once again, I have a little bit of a QR code where you're going to get this document and you there's no advertisements, I promise. Uh, I'm not collecting personal data either. 
probably when you read this, you're going to get uh, a little bit more consistent uh, information. And then there's a few more details here that are going to help you put things together. Maybe there's one or two tricks that I missed or I did not mention. Right. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Yes. Um, are you okay with that? Then I share the papers from you within my pencil cut. Yes, perfectly fine. Spread them out. Try to adapt them. Cool. Right. So, I don't know how much time we have. If you want, try to do the last exercise. If not, try to go through some of the other things. Otherwise, that's it for me.